Hello, good morning, and a warm welcome to Sports This Morning. I'm Illuminate McCauley. In the program today, it's a missed opportunity for Kanu Pillars as they missed the chance to secure a tough spot in the Nigeria Professional Football League as they fell to a 2-1 defeat to MFM FC at the Agege Stadium. We'll tell you how that happened in the course of today's show. Plus, tennis, African table tennis star Aruna Kodri will captain Team Nigeria to the Tokyo Olympic Games holding in July in Japan. So here's the HNIC, head Nigerian in charge. And on Stubur, five-time champion Venus Williams to reach the third round of Wimbledon for the first time. Venus was defeated by Jabir in that match in Wimbledon, and uh, she's reaching the first round for the first time. Venus is out, Jabir remains in. A very good morning to you, and welcome once again to the show. I'm Alumide McCauley, standing in for your regular hosts, Sissy and Tayo. And how's the weather this morning? Uh, it's bright and sunny here. It didn't play as much of a role in Wimbledon as far as the weather went, but as far as the surface goes, there were problems and criticism and complaints about it being slippery. And a number of tennis stars complained. We'll tell you and show you what they said. But first, we'll begin with the story about Venus Williams' exit from Wimbledon. And the person that was... <laughs> the culprit that sent her packing. Ans Jabeur, she's the first Arab woman to win a WTA tournament. She's now reached the third round of Wimbledon for the first time, beating the five-time champion Venus Williams, 7-5-6-0. That's, that's like, a, that's a typical David and Goliath story as far as that is concerned. Williams follows her sister Serena out of the singles. Remember, Serena left, she had an injury. Uh, and she had to go. Uh, she, although she'll play with Nick Kyrgios in the mixed doubles. Now, Serena limped off center court in tears on Tuesday, as I just said, after injuring her right leg in the first set of the match. Standing by is our channel's TV correspondent in the UK, Austin Okonakban, who is joining me bright and early this morning. Hello, Austin. Spotted greetings, Illuminate. Good to be on the show. Good to have you here. So the Williams family, totally out the door now. Yeah, disappointing. Uh, what? But that's it, uh, tennis for you. So Venus, I was expecting. I wasn't expecting her to go all the way because in, in the last um, few years, this is the sort of performance she gave. But I thought she she was good in the first set, and then capitulated in the second. Losing six love is a quite disappointing, but hey, uh, well-deserved victory for, for Jabbar. And um, Serena would have been wishing her sister can go, you know, uh, a bit further in the competition so she can hold that as some consolation. But it is what it is. Age also plays, you know, um, a big part in Venus's performances. And the good thing is that she still, she still braves the odds to come out there on the court to, you know, compete. Yeah, so um, it's day three and it's all over for her. So... Uh, so it's on to the next. Not to compare the two, because they're in the same family and they're sisters, and each wants the other to succeed, but Serena was a star of the two, and uh, now that uh, Venus is out, uh, uh, what do you think of her chances uh, going forward? In tennis, that is. I think with women's tennis, Olumide, it's, it's very fluid. It's unpredictable, you know, so you just can't come out and say um, it's all over for this and that. But for Serena, uh, it's just this elusive 24th Grand Slam that has been a problem. If only she can just win this 24th Grand Slam title and then move on, then uh, we can start talking again. But it's been such a problem. You know, she's, we've seen her fall. We've seen her push. We've seen her cry. We've seen her smile towards the final and then lose again. So it's been very difficult, but, but hey, nothing takes away the, um, the sort of story, the, the, the William sister 
uh, has given have given to women's tennis. You know, if you if you look at their story, how it was Venus first, then the dad said, "No, look, you guys don't even know what's cooking." The one that's coming after Venus is an extra special talent, and Serena popped up and went all the way. She's a champion through and through, a model for women's tennis. You know, I check out the, the new generation of you know. Tennis players when they beat her, they say, ah, that's the person that you know a lot of times, you know. So um going forward, Olumi Day, for me, with what I've seen Serena struggle for this 24th Grand Slam title, I'll just say maybe a team needs to just take it slow, let her calm down, get relaxed, maybe go off the sport for a year, you know clear ahead. The media also not helping matters. The moment she gets into the court on day one, we are reminding her that she's yet to win that 24th Edusive Grand Slam title. So, I think she should just go, you know, spa with her sister, let both of them go to exhibition matches, have fun. Venus can continue with the major competitions, but I think Serena just needs to breathe, you know, let's get, let her get back some mental alertness, some stability, also, being a mom, you know, and compet- and competing at that level isn't easy. And it's Serena. And once she gets onto that court, we expect her to be exceptional. So all of that pressure, Lumide, hasn't been good for her performance. Let's take a look at another result that happened yesterday. Sabalenka versus Bolter. And Katie Bolter um, was defeated by the second seed, Arna Sabalenka. She showed exceptional grit to rally from a set down to beat the British wildcard, who was Bolter, in a thrilling match, as it was described, and uh, she reached the third round of Wimbledon for the first time as well. Now, Sabalenka's best result at the Grassroot Grand Slam was a second round showing on debut in 2017 as a qualifier, but she bettered that with a 4-6, 6-3, 6-3 victory in a match that lasted over two hours. The withdrawal of Naomi Osaka and Simona Halep from the tournament, which was canceled last year because of the pandemic, meant the world number four, Sabalenka, then was at her highest seeding in a major. Bolter had lost in straight sets when she met Sabalenka in their only meeting at the same stage of the 2019 Australian Open, but this time she came around with better tactics, denying her opponent pace on the ball. Bolter repeatedly played the court slice to draw Sabalenka to the net, only to lob her, much to the delight of the center court crowd and the chagrin of her opponent. After an early trade of breaks, Bolter consolidated a second break of serve for a 5-3 lead as Sabalenka made errors with her ultra-aggressive approach. However, the 23-year-old Belarusian cut a frustrated figure, shrieking in anguish as she failed to convert her chances, and the crowd got behind the home favorite. Now, Austin, I just basically, that was the whole match. What was your, what, yeah, what was your impression? I think I think I, I should I should say well done to Bolta. You know, it it isn't easy when you come to a competition as a wild card, and then you you just want to you know have fun, and then you go all the way. The fact that she got a set of of Sabalenka was been there for quite some time. You know, shows that there's there's really hope for British tennis. The other day it was Draker. You know, now it is Bolta. So you can tell that the next generation of British tennis. Uh, players coming up and they are one we should look out for. But don't take anything away from the victory from Sabalenka, you know, and I'm far to, you know, you know, stand the test of character, go over two hours in a tennis match against, you know, uh, a wild card entry. It shows that she actually has some experience in the bag. Uh, four, six, six, three, six, three. You know, and when you keep that consistency from the second set and going to win the, the third set the way she did, and you can, you know, you can start, you know, saying well done to her. And that's what I told you, Lumidi, about the women's, you know, you know, category for tennis. Um, you never know. You know, every year we get to see new winners here and there. You know, and that's why whenever a new uh, player steps on that grass or clay court or whatever court, they just get this belief that uh, since Serena Williams isn't dominant anymore. And then we don't get to see uh, Naomi Osaka. Uh, so they can actually believe to go all the way to win. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm rooting for Sabalenka to, you know, get better with this win as she advances at Wimbledon. Are you also rooting for Andy Murray? Because staying with the Wimbledon tournament, he defeated Oscar Ate. And uh, is there a resurgence somewhere happening? 
it was an Os- it was an Oscar winning performance. It was an epic five set thriller. Remember, Olumide, when I talked to you on Monday, I told yeah. you that this is the sort of momentum he needs, you know, to get back into his reading. You know, games that will push him, that will make him fight. You know, <clears throat> and that was what what he did against Otte. You know, he's trying to really you know, be the Andy Murray that we used to know him. But my fear now is that it's being pushed all the way, you know. But then again, it might just be what he needs to get back his rhythm. You know, some nerves here and there. But I, I love the fact that he also showed some good character, you know, to, you know, get up, you know, and then go on to seal that victory. And then we've said it that at this stage, Andy Murray can be, you know, forgiven. If anything goes wrong with his tennis, he hasn't been here for some time. Uh, but... Each time he falls, everyone right here in the UK like, oh, that's not going to be another injury. But I love the fact that he was pushed all the way. You know, in tennis, when you go five set, then it shows that you've got grit, you've got, you know, confidence and you show good character. So uh, shout out to Andy Murray. Uh, Let's see what he can do. I love the fact that uh, at the early stage of, of the competition, even the guys that we don't really get to talk about are not respecting the guys that we always talk about. Everyone is pushing to fight and then, you know, make an impression. So a shout out to Otto also for pushing Andy Murray all the way. A shout out to Andy Murray for, you know, keeping hopes alive, for showing that, yes, he's back. And proving that yes. it can be better, you know, match after match. Mm-hmm. That match ended 6-3, 4-6, 4-6, 6-4, 6-2. 6-2. Game set and match advantage Murray. And Novak Djokovic also did well in his encounter against Kevin Anderson of South Africa. He dispatched him, and we can say truly that was a dispatch, right? 6-3, 6-3, 6-3, as well to reach the third round. Austin? That was champion stuff by Novak Djokovic, you know. And then he knows this guy can actually uh, pull an upset because Kevin Anderson is, is, is one of the guys from the old block, you know, and knows some of these players. So Djokovic knew that, look, this is just, uh, let me just go get the business done. And, and this is a man in fine form. This is a, this is a, I call Djokovic the gentleman of tennis, you know, knows how to go about his business, results oriented. The Why are you calling him a gentleman? That you can pull something off. Why are you calling him a gentleman? Say that again. Why are you calling him a gentleman? A gentleman, because look at this, the way he plays tennis, you know, and the, the way his it's, it's, it's comportment, even when he's not doing something right, you know, it's just have you seen him about, after, it's just have you seen him, about his aura. Have you seen him after the you matches know? when he's dancing and when he's making jokes? <laughs> no, even before the match, just to take a look at his behavior on the court, you know, there's just something about Djokovic that shows that this is champion stuff, you know. This this awareness he has about himself that builds his confidence, you know. Uh, I can tell a lot of tennis players at his level that Kevin Anderson would have pushed all the way, you know. And at every point that he's get, he was advancing in that match, he's letting everybody know that look, I'm not here to play. Look at how he ran in the second, you know, the, in the second set when he won that one, you know. So um, I think Novak Djokovic is 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 the model for me right now, you know. Uh, let's see if he can get all the way and then, you know, stun some of the guys and the records that they have in terms of Grand Slams. Well, I, I didn't see Anderson as a problem and he proved that 6 3, 6 3, 6 3, game over, go home next round. That's Novak Djokovic for you. Champion stuff, Olumide. Indeed. And one of his concerns about that match, which he talked about, was the grass. He tumbled on it, not the first or second person. The surface has been yep. quite an issue for the actors of the tournament of Wimbledon. We'll hear from them in just a moment of what they think about this. Now, remember the song, Blame It on the Rain, that old pop song? They're blaming it on the grass, but with good reason. Austin, um, I don't think, to my mind, I remember uh, this number of complaints about the surface at Wimbledon uh, where the professionals were playing. Yeah, and 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 the more it, you know, that it, it it hasn't been like this, you know, over the years. So there must be a problem. And uh, after Serena Williams' um, exactly. injury, um, the, the organizers had to come out to defend the courts. And part of the reason they gave is the unusually wet weather. You know, it's not like it's really raining, but then you know the the, the, the surface just gets damp. But I think they must find. Um, a solution to that because you know it's not good when you when you see tennis players 
uh, slip, uh, slipping off the court and then, you know, getting injured doesn't, it even affects them mentally because now you're extra careful, uh, you know, particularly going to the baselines and to the sides to pick those balls. So uh, it, it's really a problem, you know, because it has actually, you know, uh, gotten more media mentions than even the play itself because everybody's talking about the slippery conditions at um, SW19. So it's up to the officials, they need to find a way to come off it just so we can have a, a proper com competition. You know, a lot of players have slipped, you know, some have gotten, some have gotten injured and you, you you can't compete properly when your mind is telling you all the time, oh, you got to be careful, don't go for that ball, if you go for that ball, you're going to get injured. And Olumide, it's a nightmare for tennis players when they get injured and have to quit. It's nightmarish. No tennis player wants that to happen to him or her. So uh, Wimbledon officials must find a way to deal with this condition because it's really affecting the play. How's the weather in London, Austin? Say that again? How's the weather? Oh, the weather is okay. But, uh, but then you just come up and then it's a bit, it's, it's, it's like it's drizzling. Mm. But nothing is falling on you, but then... Everywhere is wet. I think that's what they're dealing with at, at Wimbledon. So okay, it's drizzling, um, but nothing is It's a is fine weather. Just yesterday, I was saying that the weather reminded me of Lagos. So it's a it's a beautiful sunny weather here. Okay, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the Olympics in Tokyo, Japan. Twenty two days to go. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to sports this morning. It happens once in four years. All of a sudden, the pandemic showed its ugly face and it was postponed to this year, the Olympic Games. Tokyo, Japan is the talk of the town in 22 days and it, we're still counting. Now, we have the benefit of the best of both worlds as far as sports analysis is concerned. Our very own Channels TV correspondent in the UK, Austin Okonakwan. And in Port Harcourt, Fevo Itua is joining us as well. Now, guys, it's uh, basically, you know, I I'm sure the Japanese are, you know, ready. Maybe no trepidation, but they're excited about the prospects of hosting these games. Um. Okay, yes, of course, the Japanese side here uh, and see, uh, you're very optimistic about hosting the games. Don't forget, uh, it's a four year term, and um, once a, a country has the opportunity to host the Olympics, they take all they can, they do all they can in their powers uh, to host the Olympics. Just not forgetting the last Olympics at the Rio 2016 in Gen Brazil. We saw what Brazil did, I mean, how they were able to make money from it. That's why when uh, there were talks about canceling the Olympics, you could see that the uh, president of Tokyo, uh, was against it and they were trying to do everything possible because they've spent a lot of money uh, to host the Olympics by hook or by crook. They would want to host the Olympics, but then, of course, with, without fans, it's not the same as having fans in the stadium. But we've seen the experiment in football, and maybe the Olympics might want to see okay how they can allow some fans and uh, come into it. But it's going to be a big one for Japan, not forgetting what China did in 2018. So, we're expecting the very best of the Olympics after it was postponed for a year. Austin, we should be careful, though, about uh, sacrificing safety on the altar of the fans attending the games. Yeah, but then again, we, we understand why. It has been a problem. Uh, you asked if, if Japan has been ready. They have been ready even four years ago, you know, for this Olympics. And then COVID struck. No one saw it coming. It's a pandemic. It affected, you know, everyone, you know. So, um the fans have to be very careful even going out for the Olympics. And that's what some of the dissenting voices in Japan say, don't host the games because if you're bringing people into your country and this, this virus, you know, you know, feeds on contacts, so are you going to, to do it? But um, it is what it is. What is sports without the spectators, without the fans, without those guys that will cheer you? When you're giving those record-breaking performances, you know. So, um, both the IOC and the Tokyo officials are doing all they can to ensure that they have safe zones where fans can gather and then have to the, make these games, you know, what it should be. But definitely not going to be the sort of Olympics that we know. 
to uh, Tokyo, Japan, they just want to do this to get it out of the way because of um, the damage and the losses that they've recorded uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but fans also need to be careful, particularly when you're out there and then you, you, you don't know the level of vulnerability that you're exposed to. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult for contact tracing, particularly with people from different parts of the world coming to Tokyo. So yes, Olumide, as much as I want to say the fans, look at what the fans are giving to us at the Euros. The fans being at the stadium made it a fantastic competition already. So uh, let's just hope that they find a way to actually keep everyone safe that will be going out for the games in Tokyo. Indeed, I certainly feel, I feel for the Japanese. I feel for the organizers. As you said, they didn't see it coming. Who did? But um, someone that probably saw it coming as far as leading Team Nigeria to the Tokyo Olympics is concerned was a no-brainer, really, because it was unanimously decided that Aruna Quadri will captain Team Nigeria to the to Tokyo Olympic Games. He is the 2014 World Table Tennis Player of the Year. Hardly needs any introduction for those that follow the sport. will be assisted by the captain of the Tigris, the uh, basketball team, Adara Elonu. Also, two-time Commonwealth Games gold medalist Odunai Adekoroye was chosen as the flag bearer. So, and will be assisted by African record holder in long jump, Ese Brume. So, it's a women's affair, uh, as far as that is concerned. And, um, Austin. Austin, um, okay, let me bring in Favor now. Favor, we haven't heard from you a lot. Favor, okay. team choice, uh, captain of the team, he's the uh, head honcho. There's no better person to represent the spirit of the Nigerian contingent than such a dogged and consistent performer as Aruna Quadri, right? Yeah, of course. Aruna Quadri, over the years, uh, he has attended um, so many Olympics and is somebody who uh, he has a big heart. I mean, he's um, a tennis player, a table tennis player who, uh, during the pandemic here, he had not qualified for the Olympics at that time. He's kept on pushing, you know, kept on pushing, kept on pushing. And we've seen also what he has been able to do to young table tennis players. I think he's a role model, he's a leader when it comes to the sport generally. And he's worthy of, you know, giving that opportunity. And by the way, also, I like the fact that the um, Olympic Committee, uh, you know, putting into consideration the women, of course, they've done a lot when it comes to sports in Nigeria. Uh, talking about uh, Ojuna Yadekunoye and Adara Elon of the, the Tigers. So these are, you know, this is a strong squad. I mean, squad that we can talk about prospects, we can talk about uh, being optimistic about the podium finish. And for Aruna Quadri, it's going to be a big task. I mean, I see the role of, uh, you know, a captain, a team leader in the team. Sometimes they don't look, I mean, most of the times they don't look at themselves, themselves alone. They carry everybody along. So I just hope it's not going to be so so much on it, but after all, we've had Blessing of Tagbari before now, lead the team, I mean, to good course. We've seen, we've seen what she has been able to do too, so I think it's not going to be a big task for him. But then it's a call to service for Aruna Kodri, who has given a lot uh, to, the, uh, to our darling country. And then, of course, injury has not been his friends, but uh, I think this can also be a source of motivation for him, knowing fully well that, you know, the old contingent, about um, 61 um, athletes would, uh, would uh, rather sports, would be looking towards uh, since one athlete, rather, will be looking towards his direction and then we're we'll hoping to have a good representation at the Olympics. But it's a good one. And I'm really happy that uh, a veteran in the sport uh, would lead Team Nigeria uh, to the Tokyo Olympics. And Austin, Austin, educate us, if you will. Um, is it also that important for you to choose the team captain that is chosen for the Olympic Games, or it's just a nominal head, it's just a figur figurative head, it doesn't really mean anything, or do they really have a significant role to play? Oh, yes, they do, you know, I'm, I'm, a captain is a leader, so you want to carry someone who is, you know, uh, charismatic, somebody who understands performance, someone who is um, motivational, inspirational, and I don't know probably, uh, character, you know, I've not seen Nigerian athletes who's been consistent. As I don't know, Nigeria on the map is ranked to Africa for a very long time, made record by becoming the first African to reach the quarterfinals in the table tennis event at the 2016 Rio Olympics. Is humble, is a is an approachable fellow. You know, it's somebody who will look, look at table tennis. What was table tennis in Nigeria from 2012? You know, this man single-handedly kept 
the media talking about table tennis. It goes to competition even when he's not winning. He's the fans' favorite. They are chanting for him. They are rooting for him. They are singing Nigeria's praise because of him. So yes, I don't know. Um, yeah, we apologize if you couldn't hear Austin. We're trying to fix that glitch if you couldn't hear what he was saying towards the tail end. But the major bulk of what he was saying is that Arna Quadri is the man of the moment as far as captaincy of the Olympic contingent is concerned, and he's well deserving of it as a matter of fact. Now, lined up for you is a comment from one of the members of that contingent. It's a she, and uh, she is uh, a hammer thrower nonetheless, and her name is Annette Echiwonke. She speak, she's speaking on the qualification of Nigeria at the Olympics and her qualification and why she is uh, doing it for the country. Take a listen. Yeah, no, I, I was so happy because I was, I was like, okay, I'm getting closer to the Olympic standard. And then when I heard it was an African record, I was like, oh my goodness. Like, it, it was really just a blessing, like icing on top of the cake. So I'm really grateful for that. In terms of preparation, I was just doing the normal day in, day out, grinding it, lifting, practicing, doing drills. Um, at the meet, at that meet in particular, um, I was, you're saying in May, right? The meet in May, I was going, I was like, I'm going to get the Olympic standard. And I told myself, and I even prayed, I was like, God. I pray I get the Olympic standard this weekend and I did it and then when I broke it again I, I shocked myself because it was my first throw I was like what is going on but you know I, I'm really happy with it and um, it's really this season's really more than I expected so I'm really excited about it I don't know there's something that connected me just knowing the idea of Nigeria it's my family's home and I'm um, having the opportunity to represent them on the highest stage. I mean, one of the highest stages in the world. I'm like, why not? Um, and I think just taking that pride in this country um, and in being here right now, I mean, I love it. I love Nigeria. So this is, um, I'm glad to take that with me as I move to the Olympics. And we certainly hope she does well. Now, Favor Itoa is still with us in Port Harker, standing by. Favor, speak to, if you will, uh, what you expect from, from Annette as far as the hammer throw is concerned, a strange sport for a woman to be a part of, uh, but uh, there are hammer throwers who are successful and who are female around the world. And Nigerian-based, foreign-based uh, foreign Nigerian athletes coming back to represent their country. For me, I'm so optimistic about uh, Annette Echikuwoke uh, because um, before now, we follow up progress. Uh, she was eligible to represent the United States of America and also Nigeria, but she chose to represent Nigeria. And then this year, she did something uh, magnificent. I mean, she created an African record, the first African to throw 75.49 meters. Now, she did over 70s more than four times this year. I mean, she created the season best broke a season best, created another one. And in the rankings of the hammer throw, she's amongst the top five athletes that would, uh, that you would call in the world today that can, you know, compete and then give you a medal at the Olympics. So she's Nigeria's big thing at the Olympics. I mean, with what she has done, she's done over 70, more than five times. And the current record order, she's the African record order right now. No African has thrown that before. She did that in Arizona, in the United States of America. And then her first time coming to Nigeria was at the trials in Lagos just about some weeks ago, where she, uh, you know, still did something. She threw 72.07 meters. But then she has done over 70s multiple times. And, you know, having to break your records, break your records, and then creating over 70 mark, it's a mark that you will see that, yes, we can actually finish at the, at the podium. I mean, she's really done it. It's a plus for Nigeria, you know, having to uh, get this lady represent the country, of course. It's allowed in the sport, and thank God the IWF, of course, have, has cleared, have cleared the lady to represent Nigeria. So I'm optimistic about her, and I know what she's got in her signal sleeves. She has been working so hard before now, and um, you know we are not, we don't, we're not really dominant when it comes to the field uh, event, except for uh, long jump and uh, triple jump, as the case may be. But this is a plus for Nigeria. And like I said, the rankings are favoring her right now, Annette, and she would not want to you know stop at this point in time. I think the love that she has seen in Nigeria would really support her to do a lot at the Olympics. I hope she doesn't rely. Is, but I mean, having somebody throw 75.49 meter in, in the Amar throw, it's very, very wonderful. And it's a record, uh, it is an African record. So you already put her in, you know, amongst the athletes that would, you know, give us something to cheer at the Olympics. Not just something to cheer, but a medal, hopefully, at the Olympics.
Yes, indeed, and we hope she trumps that at the Olympics' favor. Now, Austin, not to sound like a broken record, because uh, anyway, I don't think anyone likes to do that, but when issues are not addressed and you have to harp on it over and over again, then you, you're left with no choice. But as far as encouraging Nigerian athletes like uh, Annette uh, to come back to the country, to to play, to, to, to represent the country is concerned. You think the sports organizations are now going to be barking up the right tree and doing the right thing to encourage our talented athletes who are not in Nigeria or representing Nigeria? It's about that, Olimide. It's about, you know, keeping the standards that they are getting um, in the UK or the US or anywhere else abroad, you know. And it's about... It's about athletes' welfare. If they are not happy, it is going to affect performance. And we say this all day, every day, that the Olympics is just four years, a calendar. Before you know, another one is coming. So now we are, we are going for Tokyo. It's supposed to be in 2020, by the way. What are we doing for the next Olympics? You know, so um, it's difficult, but it's all about leadership. And that's why every day I charge the Minister of Youth and Sports Development to ensure that we're not doing anything. We must make sure that our athletes are well, you know, taken care of. They understand what it takes to, you know, motivate athletes so that they can give their best performance. See, for instance, the Athletics Federation of Nigeria Leadership must be top notch. We don't want a lot of fighting. We don't want persons with selfish ambition. It's about national pride and glory. So take care of your athletes. Make sure that they are happy. Give them the right facilities to train with. Give them competitions to expose themselves, compete to the best in the world. Are you going to get the results? Thanks, Austin. Let's take a flight away from Tokyo, Japan. Let's fly through the clouds and come back to Nigeria and turn our attention to football. And the match day 30 fixtures that happened. And here the results are MFM 2 1 winners over Kanu Pillars. Lobby Stars defeated Heartland by three goals to nil. Rivers United had three goals against Plateau United. FC Fanyuba, three goals as well over Adamawa United. Aimba and Wari Wolves drew 1 1. Abia Warriors couldn't uh, defeat Rangers United or Rangers Football Club. They fell by two goals to one. Jigawa GS lost to Katsina United by a goal to nil. And Sunshine Stars defeated Wiki Torres by one goal to nil. Now in that match, uh, Kanu Pillars versus MFM FC. Kanu Pillars had to play uh, away from home in Agege at the Agege Stadium. And while it was touted to be a close match, it turned out to be as far as the result is concerned. But favor it were, uh, was it a close match as far as you're concerned, as far as uh, their performance is concerned, or did the results belie the performance? Yeah, for me, uh, first of all, it was a close match. Anytime um, MFM plays Cano Pillars in Lagos, it's always uh, home away from home for Cano Pillars. I mean, uh, except for some seasons ago where MFM got, finally broke that record of not winning against Cano Pillars at home when they won three goals to one. So yesterday, it was always going to be a very, um, uh, you know, crunchy encounter. Looking at Cano Pillars, they're coming already. I haven't, uh, the one who probably come and still do something in Lagos, looking at the likes of Rabi Ali. And um, for MFM, they've had a good run of form, you know, away from home at home. And um, they took the game to the uh, Canopilla side. They got to go in the first half. But then we saw two penalties given to Canopillas, and first of them was missed by Rabi Ali before he finally converted. And then you look at the Canopilla side, young players, you know, since uh, the exit of Bolus, the new coach has been trying to push the team, you know, try to get them a very good position on, you know, on the NPFL table. And for Canopillas, they are still having sight at the NPFL title. I mean, looking at where they are right now, they're probably third with 52 points. Okay, sorry, we lost favor to our there for a second. We'll get back to him in a moment. But Austin, uh, are you of the same view? Was it as close a match as uh, favor is describing for you? And what about the other results? Give us an overview of this. was uh, a very close assessment. match. Yeah, it was a very close match, Illumide, because, you know, as favor said, uh, Kano Pillars were hoping to get on top 
top of the league table with that win, you know, and each time they come to Lagos, they get some good level of support, but that didn't happen for them this time around. Uh, losing a penalty and then converting one again uh, was not good enough, so they lost that one 2 one and with that, Aqua United, they will be singing and dancing uh, because if they go on to win today, they will still stay on top of the league table, but look at who really got us talking. Warrior Wolves, they've been a very poor team this season, went to aim, but they were so close to winning except for a late goal scored by captain of the aim side, Austin Oladako, as I gave, uh, gave um, the people's elephant uh, a point in a bar, so they must do something uh, to get back to uh, their winning form. But Rangers, uh, good win for Rangers, and they're looking like they can also compete for the league title. That's the fourth defeat in a row for, in a row for Abia Warriors. Uh, from when they lost to Sunshine Stars, they lost the reschedule fixture to Aimba, they lost to Dakada at home, and now they've lost at Rangers. So Imama, Coach Imama, Makabu and his team, they need to find a way to start avoiding what they suffered at the start of the win. It was a good win for Rivers United. The only away win from March the 30 was Katsina United going on to beat Jigawa Golden Stars. And that's a good one for... Uh, the Changi boys, the Changi boys, they won. Again, they stopped the unbeaten run of Aqua United. Aqua United, uh, before that loss, they, they were unbeaten in 18 matches. Katsina United stopped them, and now they've gone on to record another win. Back-to-back -back win for Katsina United. They're looking good uh, in the Nigeria professional football league. So let's see what Aqua United can do today, because it's all up to them now to see if they can consolidate their position on the league table. Yes, that's going to be the next... Uh couple of fixtures that we're going to be looking forward to. Aqua United versus Nasarawa United, as well as the match between Dakada and Quara United. Favorites for you, Austin? Uh, okay. Definitely, definitely uh, Aqua United because they've shown, they've shown good form this season. As I said earlier, they were unbeaten in 18 matches until they lost on March the 29th to Katsina United. Nasarawa United also, it's going to be a clash of uh, at the top of the table because Nassau United have shown good good form this season also picked themselves when they were going down and then uh, they are winning again. Uh, I think they still hold the record as the highest scoring side in the league so far this season. So Nassau United is not a team. Aqua should just, you know, push to the side. They went to Aimba. They said they were going to get something out of it and they got a, they got a point. So uh, let's see uh, against against Aqua United. Aqua United should have been dominant at home. I don't think they've lost at the next of champions this season. So it's going to be an interesting game of football. I really wish it was going to be on TV uh, because it's the sort of match that can, you know, sell the Nigeria Professional Football League. For exactly. Dakada and Quara United, um, Dakada, they, uh, they will be beaming with confidence because they went away on March the 29th to beat Abia Warriors. So... Uh, let's see what they can do against Quara United, a Quara United side that you can also push this season. They've also, you know, given us some good performances. Yes, Austin, a good idea. I think a no-brainer for the Nigeria Professional Football League to make sure these matches are on for us to watch. You're watching sports this morning. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Very interesting, very amazing. I'm very happy for the victory. Very, very happy because uh, the team is not other. Is the team leading the shot of the Nigerian Football League? And uh, I know, although we know, I know the boys are in, they are very, very fit and very mental. Okay, tactically and otherwise, and you can see what the the parade and the performance of the boys shows that uh, I think uh, the team is going somewhere. And thank God for the victory. At the end of the day, we deserve the well-deserved victory. For the team, uh, it's a bit. Uh, I'm very worried because I'm not inside the field. Rather, you know, sometimes they happen in the game of football when you the team is leading and you can see players are so very funny sometimes, and uh, the leading might go to uh, their head, and that is what exactly happened there. A few minutes they lost, uh, I think, a little bit of uh, concentration, and that would lead to a little bit of uh, lapses at that uh, defense. There. We are not supposed to lose this game, but it's not our day. We can't do anything. Let's go back to the drawing board to work against our uh, lapses and we improve against our uh, strength. I'm impressed. 
I'm pressed, not in my day. My target is to go and win the remaining matches because I'm still uh, targeting the winning the trophy. I have four home, four away. So I need at least two away to maintain my home winning. Words from the coaches of MFM FC and Kanu Pillars on the victory of MFM over the latter at the Nigeria Professional Football League matches played on fixtures match day 30. Now, Favor Itoa is still with us in Port Harcourt, sports journalist and analyst. Favor, can you give us an overview of your assessment of all the matches thus played so far? I think it's, it's been keenly contested amongst the teams in the NPFL. We've seen surprise results. We've seen teams who, uh, before now on paper, you'd you know tip them to be on top, but uh, somehow they struggled. Uh, at the beginning of the season, we saw some um, away wins, uh, which, of course, the normal uh, term used in the NPFL, we don't really normally have um, teams go away from home to away, but we, that was not the case this season. We saw lots of away wins. We saw, at some point, you know, Aqua United, at the, at the middle of the season, began an obitting run, you know, that lasted till 18 matches, which, of course, in this particular era, uh, talking about the 2000s, no team has, ever, has done that, you know, playing 18 matches on beating. We saw some uh, good play from Jigawa Golden Stars. At some point, uh, Stone, uh, the striker of Jigawa Golden Stars, scoring goals on, you know, for fun in the NPFL. And then this season, the traditional teams did not turn up at some point. Uh, for Iba International, which had, uh, you know, some outstanding matches, uh, but, they, you know, they didn't do a riot of all the matches. Uh, they fought at some point, and then they picked up themselves also at some point. And then for um, teams like FC Fine Yoba, you know, before now, you look at the team, relatively young players, but you expect them to still challenge. But now they are right now fight back in relegation. Sunshine starts back in relegation not also forgetting Warrior World. So this season has been uh, mixed reactions for the team, emotions flying left, right, centre, not also forgetting players doing extremely well. Now, now we have some players already on plus 10 goals, Rabiu Ali, Silas Wanko of Nassau United. I mean, it's been interesting. And I think the season will go down to the wire. What happened in 2016, um, when, uh, of course, the era of Rangers and um, uh, Rangers and um, uh, MFM, and what happened also when Platinum United won the league and they were battling also with Rivers United. I think it will play out this season because when you look at the table right now, there are chances that even the seventh place team, which is Rangers, can still win the league. I mean, not just about Aqua or Ayimba or Kano Pillars. We still have equal opportunities for the top seven teams in the league. So it's going to be a fight to finish. I mean, um, also the games will determine. And, you know, this is this at the time whereby teams begin to show that they have a big heart. They have this character in them and then try to take one game at a time. Don't get carried away. For instance, Aqua United know when they win today, they go top of the table. Nasarawa United also know the importance of today's game. Should they win today's game, they go top of the table. And it has not been easy considering the fact that some players are, are, are not with Aqua United right now and, you know, because of the Super Eagles friendly in you and United States of America, talking about Ashimene, Charles Ashimene, Seth Mai, and not forgetting Lisa India, why for Nasarawa United, we have Tebo, Franklin, who is a defender, is not part of the team. And then we look at the goal scorers of Nassau United this team before I heading into today's game. We have players who are already scoring goals. Silas with 11. Ike now four with uh, five goals. We also have Ohana Chom with uh, five goals, with uh, five goals. Hassan with four goals. So they have so lots of players who are already there. Why for Aqua United, their highest goal scorer is not in the team right now. But nevertheless, they still have Ufano Dov, who is also a, vet, uh, really a top guy when it comes to the NPF. So generally, yes, it's going to go down to the wire. So I think yes, it's going to go down to the wire. And we might be seeing what happened some seasons ago in the Premier League with Chelsea and Manchester United, mm. you know, whereby it was a fight to finish two seasons ago where we had Liverpool and Manchester City. So it's going to be exactly. like that. Yeah, uh, uh, this season. It looks a lot to take in, looks like a lot to look forward to. Speaking of the English Premier League, to which we will turn our attention now, his name is familiar with English fans and indeed football fans all over the world. As a matter of fact, he was the one that led Liverpool to UEFA Champions League glory uh, back in what they called the miracle of Istanbul. His name is Rafa Benitez, and he's coaching again. But ironically, he's not coaching the team with which he had that great laurel. He is coaching their arch enemies, Everton. Rafa Benitez has been appointed as a coach of Everton. Austin, I know you're still there. Um, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Should he have taken the job in the first place? Come on. Everton fans, why are they going to accept and I, and I saw, him? Why should Everton and fans accept him? I saw the smile on your face. 
Yes. I saw the I saw the smile on your face where you were reminding us about the miracle of Istanbul just because it was to, Liverpool. But that's okay. Course. But that's okay. <laughs> Okay, well, that's okay. But then again, um, I think this is a good appointment and uh, it will bring some fierce competition to the English Premier League this season. Rafa Benitez knows a lot about Liverpool. Rafa Benitez knows a lot about developmental football. So I think Everton is a good team for him to actually go and show that Carlo Ancelotti did a good job with that team last season. Let's see if um, Rafa Benitez can continue. But I love the fact now that the Messi side derby is something to look forward to the season because with Rafa Benitez on one side and Jurgen Klopp on the other side and Rafa Benitez trying to form like he knows Liverpool and giving Everton edge, I cannot wait to see it on Day. Yes, Austin. Favor, final words from Favor Itua in Port Harcourt. Favor, uh, a quick one from you on this appointment of Benitez as the coach of Everton. For me, he has a winning character. He has, I mean, winning mentality. He's somebody, of course, who can give you trophies. We saw what he also did with Chelsea at some point, also with Liverpool. And one good thing that would go for him is he knows the terrain. I mean, he's been used to the terrain. And having coach Everton, I think he's going to bring in this uh, competitiveness to Everton. I mean, he took Newcastle United from the Championship back to the Premier League. And then for a manager, Rafa Benitez, uh, Rafa Benitez, he has shown that if you give him a, a, a mid-table team, he can turn the mid-table team, he can add character to the mid-table team. So I expect a lot from Rafael Benitez. Just like Austin said, the Messi side derby would be something to look forward to and it's going to be keenly contested. So we look forward to the Premier League and also see how things go. Like Luno Espirito, of course, in Tottenham or Sports. So, so it's going to be a very big one for the Premier League come this season. Okay, those words also, from Favour uh, okay. brings uh, this uh, edition of Sports This Morning to a close. Many thanks to Austin Okunakban our channel's TV correspondent in the UK. Uh, Austin, congratulations on being a semi-new daddy. And congratulations <laughs> to the Thank missus. You. To the Thank missus you. as well. Yeah, yeah, so you've been busy. You've been getting busy. Okay, and thanks to Favor as well. And thank you for watching the Thank show you. this morning, uh, Sports This Morning. We're calling it a day. Have a good rest of your day. I'm Alumide McCauley, standing in for... Tayo and Cece will be back soon, so stay with us on Channels Television. Bye-bye for now.